Ready to upgrade your spindle? Then stick around because that's what we're doing in this episode. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel and love CNC, make sure you hit that subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest videos. In today's episode, we're going to be upgrading our 300 watt spindle to a more powerful router. And the processes and methods that we'll be using are relevant to different types of routers and CNC machines. So don't think you have to have the exact same setup that I've got. Anything I do use in the video, I will link in the description area below. Make sure you check it out. It's where I put all the useful information and relevant things from this video. For today though I will be using the Dewalt DWP611 router also known as a 262 in some countries in case you're struggling to find that specific model number. We'll be making the upgrades to the Prover XL4030 but as I say it is relevant to different machines such as the Fox Alien 4040XC I've got the other side of me. Now the great thing about today's tutorial as well is I'll be showing you how to turn the router on and off using your CNC machine. One of the big issues when people upgrade to a router is they have to manually turn it on and off and I'll be showing you how to get around that. More crucially I'll be showing you how to do it without voiding any warranty which is obviously always better for us. At the end of the video I'll also be doing a sound comparison between the noise of a 300 watt spindle versus the new Dewalt router because I know that will be one of the common questions that get asked so stick around and make sure you watch that comparison as well. But for now the first thing we need to do is take off the old router and ready, get ready to mount the new one. So before we start I would strongly suggest you disconnect the power from your control box and remove the USB cable from your computer. We'll begin by removing the wires to the spindle and we'll push that to the side. We're then going to release these two bolts to take the spindle out and then release these two bolts to take the holder off the Z carriage. Now as you release these two bolts make sure you're holding the spindle so that it doesn't drop. And once it's removed you should see the T nuts remaining that were holding it in place and we'll use those shortly to attach the new carriage. So unfortunately at this point the batteries had started to go in the microphone but essentially what I'm saying here is we're about to remove the cable so you will need to take the spiral strip off for protection if it's already still in place. Also when popping the little clips open on the drag chain try not to pop them all open on the top row or other cables may fall out so maybe leave every fifth one in place just to hold the cables that we need to leave in there. So I've taken the cable out of the first drag chain. I've left some clips in place to hold all the existing cables. I'm now going to do the side down the second drag chain and take it all out from there as well. So we've completely taken the spindle power cable out of all the drag chains and we're going to put that to one side for now. We're going to focus on the Z carriage and the spindle mount. Now the Prover XL comes with a 69mm mount as part of the package so and that is a perfect match for the Dewalt router which is one of the reasons I'm using it today. However if you're using a different size router such as Makita which is a 64mm you can either buy a new mount for this or consider making some sort of insert that goes inside to narrow down the diameter. If you have something like a 3D printer there are parts available on Thingiverse. You will also need a couple of bolts to fix it to the Z carriage, specifically the T nuts. And for those, you'll need an M5, either a 10mm or 12mm long. I've already put two through the holes. We're going to fix those to the first two T nuts, lift it up, and then put the bolts in to fix to the bottom T nuts. So we've now got the spindle mount in place and I've left the bolts slightly loose so we can raise this up and down as we'll be adjusting this shortly. I'm now going to place two pieces of wood slightly apart underneath of the mount so that when we drop the router through it doesn't hit the bed and it gives it something to rest on. Now as I bring the router in I will also point out that the cable on this has to be one side or the other, the left or the right. It can't be at the back because of how much it sticks out. Me, I'm going to keep it on the right hand side to feed into the drag chain. But it also means I can access the speed control from the left hand side. Now we can see that that is just sitting on top of the wood. What we're aiming for is to lower the Z carriage down so they roughly sit at the same level. So if I drop this down slowly now, We'll see the mount comes down with it but what we're aiming for is for the Z carriage to hit those pieces of wood and there we are. I know now those are roughly the same height which is what I'm aiming for. Now I'm going to bring the mount up a little bit to be roughly in the middle of this silver section here so we know it's going to have a good grip. And once it's there I'm going to tighten it up because I'm pretty happy with that position. Okay. 
Now what I should say, I'll be coming back to this a little bit later when we tram it in, because we want to try and keep it as perfectly parallel as possible. But we'll touch on that a little bit later. And finally, I'm just going to twist this a little bit and tighten up the clamping bolts on this right hand side to make sure it grips everything nice in it. So once everything's tightened up, we can just raise the Z axis up just to make sure everything's gripped. There we are. I'm very happy with that. So the next step is to run the cable back through the chain out the far left hand side. Now you may notice I've raised the entire Z carriage up. The reason for this and unfortunately we had audio issues again. What I'm saying here is you need to raise the Z axis up to the top limit before you start laying in the cable to make sure there is enough cable sticking out to have full mobility in the Z axis. Now when you get to the end of the drag chain you'll need to pop it out of the holding link in order to get the cable past it because you can't pass the plug through this gap here. So you pop that out, feed the cable through that gap and then drop it all back into place. So at this stage you'll need to feed the remaining cable through the rest of the drag chain. Doing the same on this opening link here that we just did on the top drag chain. Now if you have a 4030 it should all be okay. If you are using the 6060 extension kit make sure you don't use too much cable on these bends here because it is quite a tight fit to get it to come out of the end of the drag chain. And once it's all done you just have a little bit of cable left which makes it perfect for the next step. Now we're about to take a look at wiring in an SSR. Now nothing we're about to do is particularly complex, but you should only do this if you are competent in handling this type of wiring. If you have any doubt, I've just put an item on screen now which can be brought off places like Amazon. And again, I will always put a link in the description area below. This just means you don't have to necessarily wire an SSR and it's kind of all done for you. So it makes life easier. Obviously it's a little bit more expensive, but you're paying for the convenience of it. The main point here though is if you're about to to start wiring something in make sure you are being safe. At the start of the video I said we're going to be able to control the router on and off via the CNC controller and to do it we need one of these an SSR or a solid state relay. Now the way to think of this is it's a bit like a posh switch we're going to have the original cable from the 300 watt router coming into this side and then we'll have the router connected from the other side and once it detects power coming from the original cable it will allow power through this terminal turning the router on vice versa when the power stops coming to these terminals it will stop the power to those and turning the route off so that's how it's controlled now this one that i have here is a 40 amp ssr it's a bit overkill if i'm honest but they seem to be cheaper than the lower rated ones that's one of the reasons i got it but you can get away with a 13 or 15 amp something much lower than the 40. Now what we're talking about is I will just flip it over. On the back there is a metal plate. When the current is passing through these they can get warm and you need to keep them cool. So on the back the metal plate is there to try and help disperse some of the heat and you can buy heat sinks that fit onto these which aid in that process. Alternatively you can do something like keeping it well ventilated or maybe have a PC, little PC fan running close to it just to keep a cool breeze passing around it. If you do install it, as I say, just keep an eye on the temperature. You don't want it going anywhere where it's going to get too warm. Now, the other thing I mentioned at the start of the video is we're going to wire this in without voiding the warranty of our router. Now, the wiring on the router comes a bit like this example here where it's all sealed. It's a sealed unit and therefore you can't take the plug off. You can't cut into the wire. Otherwise, you run the risk of voiding your warranty. So the way we get around that is to do something like using a very short extension. This is just a two meter one gang extension. And basically what it means is we can obviously plug the plug into the wall socket. We've got the socket there for the router to connect to and we can cut into the wiring to wire the SSR in. And this way it saves voiding any warranty on the router and just makes everything a bit easier for us. So you can essentially wire the SSR anywhere along the lead that you like. Some people may find it easier to take the plug off or the socket end and start at one side or the other. Me, for my purposes, I want it about halfway down. So I'm going to remove a couple of loops. And what I'm going to do is cut through the white outer casing here to expose the wires in the middle. I'm then going to cut only the live wire, attach crimp connectors on either end, and that will allow me to connect it to the top of the SSR. So if you give me a few minutes, because it will be a bit fiddly, and I'll come back and show you how it's done. 
So what I've done is cut off the outer casing to expose the cables. I'm now going to cut the live in half and connect the crimp connectors to it. I should also stress, this is just my method for doing it. There may be better methods to attach it, but this is the one I'm comfortable with. So I've put the crimp connectors on. You can also see I've put a bit of heat shrink tubing over here. I had to take the plug off anyway in order to get it through the enclosure. So I thought it was the ideal time to get a bit of this on. We'll now apply a bit of heat to this just to shrink it all up and seal it. And then as you can see, it'll connect perfectly to the SSR. So as the final step for wiring in the SSR, we have the cable that was supplying the power to the original spindle. I've just removed the original crimp connectors that were on it and put new ones on to connect it to the SSR. And then once that is connected, that finishes up the wiring process. So the wiring for the SSR is now complete. Now I'm not particularly a fan of having exposed terminals like this. So I did quickly print a 3D cover. Obviously you can do alternative methods to cover these terminals up, but that one was nice and quick and easy for me. So I know it's not the greatest camera angle, but you should just be able to see the screen at the top with candle open and obviously the spindle below it. So with everything connected, let's fire up the spindle and see if it works. Excellent. We know it's all running as it should do. So the router's installed. We know everything's connected and working because we've tested it. There's one final thing we need to do, and that is tramming the router itself. Now, if you've seen my previous video on the 4030 spoil board, you'll know what tramming is. If you're not familiar with it, check out the link in the corner. The tramming starts at about 20 minutes in. Basically, what it means is getting the router or the spindle as perpendicular to the bed as possible to ensure that it mills everything level. Now, in an ideal world, you'll want to be doing this on a freshly surfaced spoil board. However, because I haven't installed one yet, we're going to be doing this on the aluminium bed. So I know it's not going to be perfect, but we'll get it as close as we can. So you start by bringing in something like a speed square or a set square and try and get the mount as square as you possibly can. Check all sides, left, right, and also check the front as well. Now, I don't know if the camera quite picks that up, but mine is just slightly out there. It is suggesting that it's leaning one way. One thing I have noticed, I'm not entirely sure this mount is perfectly square. So as I say, it's a starting point, but don't bank on that getting it perfect. What you'll need to do after that is create some sort of tramming jig. Now again, I've 3D printed this one. And in my previous video that I just mentioned, I do show alternative methods to do this. You can do it by zip tying two Allen keys together and you get the same results. But the purpose of this is if I rotate this slowly, you'll hear that it's not catching anything at the moment. But the further around I bring it, it just starts to catch the aluminium bed. Now basically what that means, it's either the aluminium bed is out or something is leaning one way or the other. So what we're going to do is work around the bolts and just twisting this slightly to left and right and front and back. You can shim the front and back if you need to tilt it backwards and forwards and trying to get this to the point where it's touching evenly all the way around. So I've just tweaked this slightly off camera and what I can do now is rotate this at least three quarters all the way around without it really catching anything. However, when I get to this front section here, you will hear that it catches. But the thing is, I can feel this piece of aluminium is slightly more raised than the two either side of it. So as I said earlier, this is one of the reasons you need to do it on a freshly surfaced spoil board because it eliminates any issues like this. But I'm pretty happy with how that is now. So we're going to call that done and we'll move on to the sound test. So with everything installed and up and running, let's take a look at that sound test and we can see what the differences are between the 300 watt spindle and the new Dewalt spindle. So I'm keeping this test as simple as possible. I've got an app installed on my phone for tracking the decibel readings. We're going to be paying attention to the average and maximum readouts on screen. What we will do is start up the spindle, reset the app, and then leave it running for about 10 seconds to get the average reading and then pause it. We'll do this for both spindles so we've got equal measurements. Now, the 300 watt spindle will be running at its maximum rate of 12,000 RPM. The Dewalt router will be running at its lowest rate of 16,000 RPM. So straight away, there is already a difference in the speed between them, but it is the closest that we can get them. Now, I should also point out, we are running this without any bits in or without load. So chances are these levels will be slightly lower than when the machine is actually running. But again, it's just to get a rough idea of the differences between them. 
So let's fire up the spindle, reset the app and see what the first reading is on the 300 watt spindle. So there we can see we have an average reading of 65.9 and a maximum of 68.5. Now once we've got the Dewalt rater installed we'll do that same test and compare the results. So I've replicated the setup as accurately as I could to avoid anything affecting the results. Now let's remember that the Dewalt router does naturally spin faster than the 300 watt spindle so I am expecting some difference between the decibel readings. Let's get this fired up, reset the app and then check the measurements. So there we can see an average readout of 73.6 decibels and a maximum of 75.2. So it is naturally higher than the 300 watt spindle, but as I say, we're getting a lot more power for what we're running. So when you do the math, that is around an eight decibel difference. Now, as I've already stressed, it's not scientific. And one thing I didn't take into account is the running noise of the machine itself. Now off camera, I did a quick test and that averaged out at around 70 decibels. So in actual fact, the only difference between running the 300 watt and the Dewalt router is about four decibels, which isn't much at all. But crucially, it's 300 watt versus 900 watts so you get a lot more power for those extra couple of decibels. Now when I planned out this video I had no intention of doing a test cut as part of it I just wanted to show the installation and the correct wiring of the router itself however I couldn't resist so I had to get a piece of wood on the on the board and get it cut and we did this quick test piece in some MDF. Now without any testing, I went straight in at 1200 millimeters per minute with a plunge rate of 250 millimeters per minute up to a maximum depth of five millimeters as part of the V cut. I also used probably one of the cheapest 60 degree V bits I could find off Amazon purely because it arrived very fast in order for me to do this test cut and it handled it absolutely fine. I wouldn't recommend one of those bits. They don't seem great quality, but it did an okay job as part of this test so I'm really looking forward to see what this is fully capable of when we start pushing the speeds and depths to see what the results we can get. Now that does cover everything for this video as always if you have any questions or hints and tips for me in regards to the installation do let me know in the comments section below as I always say I love chatting with everybody. Thank you always to my Patreon supporters you really help keep this channel going and if you want to get involved check out the Patreon links in the description area below. That is everything and thank you all very much for watching. I'll see you on the next episode.